Welcome to the Answer is Yes podcast, where we interview some of the most interesting people that have said yes to opportunities in their life. We hope that through these stories, you can learn to create your own destiny by saying yes along the way. Join us as we explore the new series covering topics such as passion, integrity, and hard work. I'm your host, Jim Riley, and I hope you enjoy these interviews as much as I do. I believe that everyone has an important message worth hearing. Hello and welcome to the Answer Yes podcast. Thanks for tuning in. It is Christmas week. Hopefully everybody's got their shopping done. It's uh, Montana time up here. We've been getting snow. Hopefully uh, people got out on the mountain this last weekend too. So anyways, we want to talk about all kinds of neat things that have been going on in the country and in your local areas, especially our area up here in Montana. And I've got a very unique guest. I think I'm kind of on a political theme here the last month and uh, you know, it's hard not to be with everything that's going on in the world, as well as our electoral process and in the individual states with COVID and restrictions and all that. And I've asked John Fuller to be on the show today. John, how are you? I'm doing great. and Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So your official title uh, for your governmental position, House District... What? Uh, I am a member of the Montana House of Representatives, representing House District 8. House, how many representatives are there? There are 100 in the state of Montana, wow. and there are 50 state senators. Okay. okay. And that, that's got to be relatively small compared to some of the bigger states, population-wise? Oh, absolutely. With a, a population of only a, a, a little over a million people in Montana, basically then each representative is representing 10,000-plus uh, constituents or citizens of Montana. Okay. So how many representatives would a state like California have? Well, California has approximately the same amount of 100 in the House of Representatives. But okay. Obviously, with what, 54 million people or whatever there is it 54 million? It's probably. Okay. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, each representative in the House would, would represent a considerably larger number. Yeah. Wow. Well, I want to talk about that towards the end game here. Uh, you've had a fascinating life. We've talked a little bit about wrestling over our coffee. Uh, the other day or the last couple times we've gotten together. So um, I'm, I'm curious what type of career you had to go through and wind up in Montana in this position you're currently holding and, um, you know, the path along the way. So if, if you want to take us back, maybe back to your college years and tell us what you were doing back then. And um, uh, Okay, well, uh, I was... Uh, uh, I was born and raised in California because I wanted to be close to my mother, and she was the Department of Defense uh, uh, employee that worked for the Department of Air Force in, mm -hmm. the, la in the last years of her life, and, and uh, when I, therefore I, she was stationed at uh, McClellan Air Force Base, north of uh, in north of uh, north of Sacramento, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was born and raised there, and uh, I became a wrestler, and I ended up going to uh, college in Illinois. Uh, wanted to wrestle in Illinois and became a college wrestler. And uh, 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 but I was young when I started uh, college. I was only 16, and so when I was 18, uh, I I thought I was going to uh, uh, be a all American wrestler, but I got hurt, and so I took a, a year's leave of. Of, from college, and I traveled around the world. Okay, I want to stop right there real quick. You were in college when you were 16. Yes. And now, is that because you, um, academically, you excelled faster and you graduated sooner, and then you decided to go to college? How, did, how does that happen? Uh, in those days, you know, uh, well, remember that in 1957, Sputnik changed American education. Okay. Whether you wanted to or not, if you had an IQ of above 45, you were put in accelerated math, science, and uh, it's uh, all those STEM. Okay. Okay. And uh, so I must have had an IQ of over 47 or something. <laughs> anyway, but coming from a family of educators and lawyers, I didn't have much choice. And so I had skipped two grades in elementary school and then went on and proceeded and graduated from high school uh, with all kinds of classes that if we'd had the same kind of opportunities that we have today, I would have probably started college at 16 as a junior, but I didn't. Right. Okay. So here you are, 16, you graduated high school, and you decide you want to go to college in Illinois, but you're from California. Well, 
I was a stud wrestler, remember? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Even though I was young, I thought I was I thought I was a stud wrestler until I uh, got into the wrestling room with my uh, the, 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 our kid. He was a defending national champion, and I spent the first three months breathing insulite. Yeah, uh, I bet. Uh, Get your butt kicked. How does your mom say, okay, go ahead, you're 16, go off to Illinois and go to school? Uh, you, if you can believe this, my mother put me on a bus uh. in June of 1963 uh-huh. to go to col- start summer school at college, and I went there by myself. And it was a different era, I guess. And I was independent and uh, glad to glad to be on my own. Yeah. Well, so I'm I'm looking at today's youth, yeah. right? Yeah. Your grandson's in the room. Two years from now, you're going to college in another state. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's smiling over there. I mean, I, I just can't imagine it. Uh, were you in the dorms out there? Yes. Okay. So you didn't have to go find a place to live and no, a job. No, like... no, I didn't have to do that. And and the wrestling team took care of me. Yeah. Yeah. You know they. They uh, they were my brothers and you know and do whatever took care of me, but so anyway in '65 uh, I decided to travel around the world and so I left in college or I took a year you know leave from college. Well, when I got back in '66, I found that my draft board, which was still located in California, mm-hmm. was waiting for me because of the Vietnam War. So I jumped back in school, but. I didn't no longer could get a what well, in those days was known as a student deferment, and so I was one A, and I was only able to continue school for a semester before in January of '67. The U.S. Army told me, "Give me that guitar here. Take this rifle." Uh huh. You know, and uh, so I went in the military. And uh, well, uh, by the way, John, you know, look, most of our audience spans different ages typically youthful in their, in their 20s, early 30s. Th- this is an education on what's happened in our history that a lot of people don't even know about or have taken the time to look up. Um, how did the draft work? And was it something that everybody was happy to go along with? Or was it, this is the country we live in and this is what we have to do, and even though I don't want to go? I mean, what was that like? Okay, well, uh, being a, a Montana legislature, mo- legislator most likely to give you a history lesson with every speech, I'll k- give a quick history of the American draft. Yeah. Uh, the, um, America's had a draft ever since the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the, the, then the World War I, the draft was re- uh, reinstituted, and uh, the Selective Services uh, Associ- Association or uh, Agents Administration was created, and then... Uh, World War II, they drafted people. Of course, uh, after the first year, they needed to draft people more. And then uh, the, the draft was in existence, but not used throughout the 50s, the Korean War and then the 50s. But it was ramped up in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, in essence, though, because uh, the, you were uh, given a, 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 a – if you started college – immediately after high school, you were eligible to get what was called a student deferment. Mm -hmm. But it was only good for four years as long as you were engaged in a full-time college, uh, in in good standing and full-time in college. Okay. Okay. Uh, When in 1960, beginning in late 1965, the the need for the military got ramped up. Now, full perspective on that, the president at that time, Lyndon Johnson, was determined not to was to try to fight the Vietnam War starting in 1965 on the cheap because he didn't want to sacrifice the great society. Mm-hmm. And so the uh, he didn't mobilize the nation behind the war effort, and he relied upon the draft to meet his manpo- the manpower needs. Well. Not the, the American public knew what was going on in Vietnam by 1965. And by the way, there's the great movie uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young was in November of 1965, which uh, was a uh, epical uh, watershed time of the begin of the Vietnam War effort. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so I urge people to, to read the book better than the movie, but the, both are good. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so. The need for the manpower was accelerating rapidly, and the volunteers, there were volunteers, but most, a lot of the volunteers were, of course, volunteers uh, that were faced with the eminent draft, so went ahead and volunteered. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, so when I 
interrupted my college education. I lost my student deferment. And I immediately became, because I, I was still warm and breathing, uh, a 1A deferment. Okay? And that meant 1A. And so they kept, uh, I kept trying to postpone it because I was anxious to finish college. And I was thinking I would go into the Army as an officer. But the draft got me in, in January of 67, and so hmm. I went into the military then. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the political environment right now, what's happening with the election, and, and I, you know, whatever way it goes, there's probably going to be a lot of unrest in the, in, yeah. the, in the country. What was the unrest like during Vietnam with the draft and everything else going on in, okay. in your mind? Well, what most people don't realize is, that the overwhelming majority of the American public supported the Vietnam War effort until roughly the spring of 1968. Mm, okay. The great Tet Offensive, which, by the way, I arrived in, in uh, 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 Vietnam in this, right during the middle of the Tet Offensive. Okay. And, and the Tet Offensive is an epical event because it changed American public opinion. Now, what a lot of people don't know, maybe this audience don't, doesn't know, is that the Vietnam, uh, excuse me, that the Tet Offensive of 1968 was a major American military victory. We slaughtered the Viet Cong. The mm -hmm. Viet Cong ceased to exist after that battle, after that period was over. Mm -hmm. The rest of the war effort was carried on by the North Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know what the Viet Cong was, the Viet Cong were South Vietnamese who had joined the communist uh, of North Vietnamese in the war effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, we slaughtered them. However, as is evident today, that is the beginning, really, of the media beginning to change and play a role in formulating public opinion, not reflecting it. Mm. Because the media's portrayal of the Tet Offensive began the switch in American public opinion against the war effort. Hmm. And so the war effort, the anti-war movement began and continued and grew in strength. And, of course, uh, the uh, so uh, in 1968, uh, Richard Nixon is elected president, as in March of 68, after the middle of the Tet Offensive still going on, Lyndon Johnson realized that his own party was against the war and they were going to take it out on him and he chose not to run again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, uh, the and of course, in the summer of 1968 was the Chicago Democratic National Convention that resulted in riots and violence in the streets. It made Portland look like uh, uh, a Christmas party. Uh, okay, <laughs> you, you mean this last stuff we've seen in Portland? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. It was uh, it was massive. And, of course, uh, uh, the mayor of Chicago was not like the mayor of Portland. Uh, the mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley I, uh, was determined to crush uh, that. And, of course, uh, later they claimed that the police of Chicago engaged in uh, uh, police riots against the demonstrators. Mm. Well, you know, uh, the, uh, there used to be a saying for people who lived in, in, in Illinois, uh, in the Chicago area, there are three things you do not do. You don't spit on the wind. You don't spit into the wind. You don't tug on Superman's cape, and you don't mess with the Chicago police. <laughs> okay. I believe that. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, um, uh, Hubert Humphrey emerged out of that, and Richard Nixon won that election. Of course, as mm -hmm. we all know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, then uh, he, uh, but the war dragged on until 1972 when he did that. And of course, by that time, I was home. Uh, I had served my two years there, and uh, by the way, we were winning when I left, <clears throat> and uh, 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 contrary to what the progressive historian revisionists would like to portray, in actuality, the American military did an incredible job and won that war, but the American people lost the peace. Hmm. Interesting. Because... By 1972, uh, by 1974, after Watergate, when Richard Nixon is forced to resign, Democrats won both houses of the Congress, mm -hmm. and they immediately shut off any economic aid, even though American military uh, uh, efforts were minimal in South Vietnam.